a few weeks ago, I took a, a website security course and uh, I learned quite a bit. Um, there's a couple of things that I was doing wrong uh, that I could have improved upon. So I figured I'd do a, a quick presentation and I'm going to do some follow up videos to this so that way you guys can kind of see all the things that I, I cover in this presentation uh, in action, which I'll link to the, all those videos in the description. Uh, so I'm going to get started. Uh, start starting with website security, adding security to your web applications. Uh, the first thing oops, is SQL injection. Um, this is one of the more common exploits that people try to do on an application, especially one that was hand built uh, by someone just learning PHP. Anything that gets put out into production, you should definitely have some security checks there. Uh, so basically, a SQL attack is someone to try uh, that are trying to attack your database through non-escaped or validated data. data. Uh, basically, you have a user input field. Um, let's say you have a, an application form or a sign-up form, and you have the username, password, and a couple of other fields. Uh, any one of those fields that's going directly into the database that should really be validated and checked before it actually gets to the database or the SQL uh, insert. Uh, attackers can download the entire database depending on how your uh, database is set up. They can wipe out the entire database structure, corrupt the database, the database structure and data, and cause a denial of service. Um, this is one of the more, uh, well I shouldn't say less used, but it's someone who's just trying to run this really long churning query and it binds up your, your database. Um, anybody who's on a shared hosting account most likely if that happens, uh, you're going to get a notification from your host and then they'll come in and let you know, you know, we're going to shut you down if you don't get this corrected and, and it can become very problematic. Um, the examples and these examples, I, they're, they're examples only. Don't use any of them. Anybody who's watching this video for uh, ideas to do any kind of malicious stuff, this is not what this video is about. So definitely don't do it. I don't condone any of that. So uh, you're on your own at that point. Um, but delete the, the contents of the table. So here we go. We have example.com and we have an index.php file, which is pulling in something from uh, with an ID of two. Uh, so let's say we have a user's table. And this is someone just going in and who's kind of guessing what your table structure is. Uh, so that's why it's a good idea to either prepend your uh, tables with some kind of odd uh, special character, whether it's uh, 2C3 underscore users would be a table um, and then just use that 23C underscore as your your prefix for all your tables. Um, that way it makes it a little bit harder for people to, to figure out what your table structure is. Um, but this would go in and this piece here ID equals 2 would that would stop right there because you have a terminator. You have the semicolon and if you're uh, depending on what your database is, it may allow this second query to be run, which would be delete from users, and that would delete everything from the user's table. Uh, so all of your users, even your admin accounts, would be deleted. Uh, very, very powerful thing. Um, corrupt a database column. Uh, so this would be along the same lines. They're pulling in ID 1. That first query statement gets terminated, and then alter table users, column name, username, and then... Uh, convert that to an int uh, int one. And what that would do is it would take anything, it would basically try and convert the value inside of the username field in the database or in the table and try and convert it to an integer. And because it's not an integer value, it's going to truncate it and you're going to be left with probably null or zero. Um, and then all your usernames are now gone. Uh, so it's definitely, definitely very problematic there. Um, doing this from a form, Let's say we have a login form, um, and this is going into your password field. Someone who is trying to guess how you're putting your query together, if you use single quotes, and then this is true for single quotes or double quotes, um, your password field, it's going to be, uh, or your password is going to be test1234, single quote, which ends that uh, equal statement for password, or 1 equals 1, which will make that statement true all the time. Uh, so this would be the resulting query. Select star from users where username is equal to X or whatever you're being passed from your uh, field. And where password equals, and this is where that first single quote gets started. And then this is the value that, whoops, this is the value 
that's getting passed in. So test one, two, three, four, n single quote, or one equals one. And now your, your SQL statement is now, um, it's going to return pretty much everything from, from your user's table. Uh, so that could be very, very troublesome as well. Anybody who's using this to try and log in, if you're just checking to make sure that the user is getting passed back some information, um, then th this one will be, uh, this will let them in. So SQL injection. What, what are some ways to prevent SQL injection? First is use MySQL real escape string, and that'll get rid of any of those harmful characters that can be used to exploit your, your uh, SQL statements. And then the easiest method, which it does take, take a little bit to uh, learn prepared statements, but I definitely recommend it. It does all the escaping for you. It does all the pretty much the validation on the fly for you. Um, it is object oriented, so it may be a little bit harder to learn in the beginning, but it'll protect you in the long run. Um, so I would recommend doing that. Here I have an example of using a prepared statement, and I'm going to go through and put a video together on using PDO um, and doing that in an application. So we have, and forget this uh, line change 23, uh, we're in a try block, we are creating a PDO object. We're passing in our connection string, which we're using MySQL as the database type. And PDO is just a database wrapper or a database object, which uh, wraps the, uh, or abstracts the, the data access layer. So now you can just do the same queries or, or the, use the same methods, but change up your connection string. And now you can use like PostGrel or, or uh, SQL Server or any one of those other uh, database types. You could even use Oracle if you wanted to. Um, but you put in your connection string here, your pass, your username and your password. Then you put together your uh, SQL or your, your query string. See, uh, select star from users where ID equals. And then here you're putting in a placeholder. Anything with a uh, colon and then a variable name, that becomes a placeholder, which it's going to, it's, afterwards you're going to go in and bind that uh, a value to that placeholder, um, which we'll get into afterwards. Uh, on the PDO object itself, use the prepare statement and pass in the, the query string, and that's going to prepare that inside of an object. And the resulting object, I call it prepared here. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but prepared has some additional features on the object itself, like bind value, which you can actually bind a value to the placeholder. So ID becomes one, which replaces user ID. Um, and then you run execute on the prepared statement, and that'll load all the data for that SQL query into that prepared object. And then you use the fetch all or fetch row or um, any one of those methods to get the result back. Uh, and then you just iterate through them for each or however you want to want to use it. And then down here, I'm just doing a catch block on the PDO exception for anything that's uh, might might cause problems or, or something that's not working correctly. Um, so that's how you use prepared statements in a nutshell. Like I said, I'm gonna put a video together on that. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, the next one, cross-site scripting and cross-site uh, oh, uh, injection attacks. Uh, this one can be very, very troublesome, uh, especially if you're using some kind of comment system that's not being filtered correctly. Uh, basically, someone puts in a comment or something that's displayed on a web page, and the information wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, filtered correctly or wasn't validated correctly. You're basically passing in straight text into the database and loading straight text from the database. Um, common uses for this is getting user session cookie information so that uh, they can actually use that information to impersonate someone if the session is still active. Uh, redirecting users to a bad website. So if you go to a comment section, you load up the comment. Uh, in that, it does a J uh, JavaScript redirect, and now you're sent to, let's say, Facebook is the, is the website that's being targeted. Uh, they build a web page that is exactly like Facebook, but instead of doing the login, once you fill out the, the login form, they actually have your username and password, which is stored in a database. So that that's very, very uh, bad right there. Um, and then disrupting the flow of the website. The, this one and uh, disabling visibility of following content kind of go together. And that's basically someone puts in a div with a style of uh, display none. 
and they don't close that div and anything that follows that div is now going to be hidden because you're it's inside of that div um, it's not you're not closing it so like the footer anything that follows that's not going to be displayed and that kind of, it can be a problem if you can't figure it out or if, if you don't know what to look for right away um, so examples of cross-site script you do the uh, window location in JavaScript, which will send you to the badsite.com. Um, alert document cookie, which this is a very dumbed down version, but this gives you the, the document cookie of the user. And if you were to pass that over to a server, and once you get that, use that information to uh, use that information to impersonate that person now you have all that information and you can actually do that pretty easily uh, and then this is the last one that I was just talking about with a div style display none any comment that follows that div is not going to show up and that people might keep on trying to uh, put in their information or are trying to resubmit the comment thinking it's not going through but really it's going through it's just not being displayed on the screen uh, let's see ways to prevent cross-site scripting uh, the most effective way is using HTML entities method. This will strip out any of the, or I shouldn't say strip out, it'll convert the HTML code into the uh, HTML counterparts. So the greater than, less than uh, symbols, those will be converted to uh, ampersand, GT, semicolon, all that stuff. Um, so it'll do the code conversion. And then also use strip tags. There are ways around doing that, so I would still recommend using HTML entities, but strip tags will go through and it'll try and remove as many HTML tags as possible, so it's just straight text left. Again, there's ways around that. Um, and then HTML special characters, and that'll just try and remove any special characters that, that might be uh, in there. Uh, using a white list of approved elements. This is uh, a good alternative. Using white lists are, are great. Um, Whitelist, you can say, I want span, paragraph, um, those kind of things allowed, but I don't want any script or any, uh, any divs or anything like that allowed inside of, inside of that element.